uh, Jeff Berardelli, B-E-R-A-R-D-E-L-L-I, and I'm CBS News uh, Meteorologist and Climate Specialist. Okay, and um, so it's great to have you. I'm fascinated by all the research you've done and work you've done. So let's talk about it. I mean, we'll get right into climate change, what we're seeing this year, even this month. I mean, just describe how much the climate obviously has had an impact of the changes we've seen and what's going on with our planet and what we're seeing day to day now. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to heat waves, there's a direct line between climate change and heat waves. There are other things out there, you know, that it's hard to quantify. Like, you know, what are the what's the impact of uh, climate change on tornadoes? We're not 100% sure what, what that will be. But we do know that climate change makes heat waves worse just by the fact that climate change has already raised um, temperatures in the West by a few degrees. So you're at least adding a few degrees on the baseline of a heat wave. So if a heat wave average temperature, let's say, was... 100 degrees in 1900. Now the average temperature of that heat wave is 104 in parts of California. So that's just the beginning of it. Um, but then remember, you know, what, what pressure systems do, as you know, because you do this for a living, they gather, gather heat. Heat kind of gathers under that heat dome. And so it's not just a, a four degree increase, it's, it's multiples that. It's likely closer to, you know, maybe as much as let's say it's four or five degrees right now, but by the end of the century, one of your scientists in California quantifies that it's likely going to be as much as 10 degrees more. So from 1900 to 2100, we would have increased the intensity of a heat wave by close to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, possibly. That's a lot. Yeah. And obviously for people here, they're seeing these effects in the form of wildfires and it's just uncomfortable outside, you know, yeah. it's too hot. Yeah. Um, then there's hurricanes yeah. going on. Um, so for people that are you know, it's just a bad year. Yeah. Things will get better. What do you say to that? I'll say 2018 was a bad year. You know, so was 2016. That was a bad year. You know, how many times can we have a bad year where it's no longer coincidence and it's just the actual trend of things? And so, you know, um, first of all, you know, beyond just that, you know, measure of what your eye sees and what you experience in your life, uh, science has ways of kind of figuring out, you know, how much of this is due to climate change and how much of this is due to natural cycles. And so there are thousands upon thousands of peer reviewed articles which link a lot of what we're seeing to climate change, specifically when it comes to fires, because that's obviously right up your alley there. Um, you know, a lot of the increase is due to more aridity, so more dryness in the atmosphere. So when the air temperature rises, the moisture content actually does go up some. So if your air temperature rises by that much, your moisture content does actually go up. So there's actually more, slightly more moisture in the air, but it only goes up that much. That gap right there, that is what is increasing. The, we call it a vapor pressure deficit, but really it's a moisture deficit or a moisture gap. And that gap, that relative humidity gap, is what is causing not only the air to dry out, but the brush to dry out. And when science looks at that, they find there's a direct correlation, a direct line between aridity or this moisture gap and the intensity and the acreage burn from these uh, fires. So that we are certain of. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not arsonists starting these fires every once in a while. It doesn't mean that lightning doesn't start the fire. Fires don't spontaneously combust. They have to start somehow. We know that we're not stupid as climate scientists. We also know that having extra brush around or not allowing fires to burn is also a contributor. We know all that, but even with that, the science says that a lot of this, a lot of the increase in fires is due to warming, to a warming atmosphere. It's really as simple as that. Okay, so what has led us to this point? Clearly, you know, you've been studying this for years, but as a planet, I mean, we've done a lot of damage. So if you could explain what, what got us here now. There's a lot of people and we consume, we consume a lot. Uh, and, you know, the Industrial Revolution was a big part of that. So, you know, look, I, I hate to just uh, denigrate fossil fuels because it got us to where we are. We would not have these phones, this computer, probably wouldn't have the jobs we have. We would, we would not be able to do the things that we do today all over the world without fossil fuels. But, you know, every action has a reaction. And we've found over the past few decades that the reaction of burning so many fossil fuels is that it does have a negative impact just like a lot of things have a negative impact you know you eat a lot of carrots carrots are good for you that's wonderful but if you overdo it you're going to turn orange you know so so we know that everything has a, a reaction and in this case we realize now that the reaction is 
a bad one, that it's ruining our planet in many ways. And, but the good news is that we finally, over the past few years, gotten to a breaking point where we have the technology and it's cheap enough, cheaper in many ways than fossil fuels, solar and wind, and it creates a lot of jobs. So we've gotten to that inflection point where it's actually better to switch over. Problem is the old guard, as, as you might imagine, you know, people who are in the fossil fuel business who have a lot of power, they wield a lot of power in Congress, uh, and you know, uh, they have a lot of money at stake, don't wanna lose that power. So it's a big battle now, even though we know there's a better way. And we know that the economy can benefit from switching over to renewable energy just simply because it has to create millions of jobs because it's all brand new, right? It's brand new, so it creates a lot of jobs. We know all that, but fighting the entrenched power is almost impossible and it's gonna take decades to do it. But the bottom line is, you know, sometimes when you go to the doctor, unfortunately, people get a terminal, um, you know, uh, they have something terminal and, and the doctors don't know how to save them. We know what the issue is. It's not a disease that we don't know about. We know how to solve it. We have the technology to solve it. And actually it turns out that it's better in the long run to do it. So there's no reason not to switch over to renewable energy. It's just a matter of duking it out with the entrenched power to try to make it happen. And right now with people, you know, literally getting smacked in the face by these effects, I mean, there's hurricanes, there's fires, they're losing homes and lives and all of this. Is this the turning point? Do you see a shift going on in your careers? I mean, are you seeing this happen? positive light, I guess? Yeah, you know, a lot of what I emphasize when I talk about climate change is that there's so many benefits to going to renewable energy, to, to, to kind of switching the way we do stuff, and it's, and it's feasible. I don't really go the political route because I, I see that it's been a dead end, not only in this country, and, and especially now, um, you know, the Supreme Court is gonna become a, a huge, um, possibly blockade for climate action in the future. Um, because generally speaking, uh, conservatives uh, are not pro-climate, although there's some aspects of climate change which they want to deal with, which is stuff like build, you know, planting trees. But unfortunately, planting trees can only really get you about that far. We need to go that far. Um, so politics factors into it. And also, you know, we can't agree in our own Congress. How do we expect to get agreement among all these countries? Of course, the Paris Accord did get us agreement, but it was only voluntary agreement. These countries, by law, weren't, weren't forced to do anything. So that was never really gonna get us there. It was nice to see the countries agree to something, but none of them had any obligation really. So I don't know that there's gonna be much of a political solution to this. So I always emphasize the fact that it's just gonna create more jobs and it's an opportunity for our economy, a big opportunity, especially for middle America that have hemorrhaged so many jobs. That's where most of the jobs are gonna be created. And so I think, it's a, I think it's an economic solution. I just don't know that politics can react fast enough, but I can tell you this, our wallets, react much faster than politics do. Right, and um, as far as individuals, for us to just day-to-day -day lives, um, what do you think? I mean, people who care and want to help and obviously want to see an improvement in our planet, it's, it's hard not to feel hopeless sometimes. Is our day-to-day -day action gonna make a difference? But what do you tell people as far as what we can do? So I think this is an important distinction. You changing your light bulb is not gonna do anything. It's nice that you do it, but what it does do is it, has an influence on the people around you, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son, your aunt, your uncle, whatever it be, your neighbors. So if you buy an electric car, it's pretty likely somebody on the block is gonna buy an electric car within a year or so. And then it's pretty likely that two people that know those neighbors might buy an electric car. So the point is, is it's a grassroots effort. If you start to um, respect the planet and the environment and understand that, you know, this, infinite consumption is not sustainable. It's just our planet's not gonna sustain it. It's gonna come back and kill us. You know, if you understand that and, and you take it to, to heart and you can have an influence on the people around you, especially the younger people who do have an influence on their friends and you know, their relatives too. A lot of times it's the, it's the daughters and the sons, the teenagers who influence their parents to be better stewards of this world. Um, that's how you have an influence. So it's not so much that changing your light bulb or driving an electric car is gonna even make a teeniest of dents, it's not. 
but it will change the people around you such that over the course of a generation, people will become, I think, more respectful of the earth. And we're already seeing that happen in the young generation. So it's more of a pet rock kind of phenomenon. You know, you probably remember the pet rock. Yeah. You know, people, everybody bought the pet rock because it just became popular. Well, we want climate to become not a pet rock that, that last two years, a fad and then fades. We want a pet rock to be a sustainable fad, if you will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it's going to be on TikTok or something, we can make yeah. it grow. Right? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so let's talk about also your life too. I mean, your passion obviously for this, but how did, how did you evolve into doing this now uh, daily to remind people what's happening? That's a good question. So it's multifaceted and I think there's a lesson to, to learn in it. So bear with me here. I obviously am passionate about climate change. Um, the craziest thing, and I will tell you this, is that it, for me, it comes from a, a very moral and ethical place. I just simply think that we're not being kind to the world, uh, not, not just to the actual physical rock that we live on or the water that we live on, the planet, but to the animals, uh, but to the other people, the poorer people in the world. It, for me, it's, a, it's, it's, it's equality. You know, it's even if you do believe that God created, if you believe that God created this world, then you also believe that we're putting up, we're putting our feet up on God's couch right now. You know, like it's not polite, it's not respectful. So I always, when I speak to people who that are religious or spiritual, I say, if you really do believe that this was created by a creator, then we are trashing his or her house, you know? So for me, it comes from a very moral and ethical standpoint. Uh, you know, on a more personal note, my wife wanted to move to New York City and she wears the pants in the family. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, I, it was up to me to try to figure out how to get us to back to New York. I'm from New York. I've been, this is my third time here. But my wife is from Florida. She didn't ever live here before and this was her dream. So I wanted to make her dream come true. Um, so I said, well, um, let me go back to school at Columbia. Let me leverage my um, connections at CBS News because if you've been with CBS a while, you might know that I've worked on and off for CBS for 15 or 20 years or so. And it's a long story and I don't want to bore you with it, but it was a lot of persistence, a lot of ingenuity. I believe it or not, interned at cbsnews.com last year so that I could oh. get or I, I worked for free. I wrote articles three times a week and, you know, and use that as a, a credit for Columbia University to get my master's degree. I did all kinds of weird stuff, you know, good stuff, important stuff to, to get my foot in the back in the door, if you will in a different capacity. And I also, and this is for the other meteorologists that are out there, you know, people can get their weather from an app these days, so we have to learn how to differentiate ourselves. And I really feel like us as, as, as TV weather presenters can, can give our TV stations more value by giving them one other attribute. And, and, and I believe that attribute is climate science because we have the background already, right? The science, we, we have it in our brains, why not just leverage that to give more value to not only our TV stations, but also our viewers? Because at some point, people are just going to rely on the apps and they're not going to rely on us anymore. And so it was a whole compilation of things that came together. And I said, this is a win, 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 win. Let me just go for go for it and see if see if I can pull it off. <laughs> and I love that CBS wants a climate scientist available to them, right? Well, I mean, it keeps you busy. <laughs> that was um, uh, that took uh, convincing. That yeah. was uh, them that there's value in this and that it was necessary for the news media to cover climate change. It wasn't being covered at all, and that was that was really the impetus. I said, there's a need. They don't realize there's a need in New York City for this climate expert, but there's a need for us to communicate climate change. As a person who does weather yourself, we are probably the best to fill that void. And the reason is because we have both the science and the communication. It's not easy for scientists to communicate, but we know how to do that. And so I just feel like we are the best poised in the best place to do it. That was the job I, I needed to convince CBS News to to, to adopt that and it's taken still taking time <laughs> but uh, but I, but I but you know I've, I've, I've accomplished it to some yeah. degree no definitely your message gets heard which is what matters right that's, yeah. the, that's what we that's hope what to do trying, that's what we're trying yeah. to do yeah 
and having yeah. it on a global level is like the main goal, I guess. <laughs> so, well, yeah, the hope we is that it, that permeates down. You know, it, it that it permeates out that other meteorologists are willing to. It's not easy, right? You live in San Diego, so it's a bit easier for you. But it's not easy for a meteorologist in the middle of the country to speak out on climate change when their viewers are kind of angry that we even speak about climate change. Um, so it takes guts and um, and some meteorologists are willing to, to take that chance and others aren't. And in some cases, they're not allowed to by their TV stations because they have a conservative audience. And uh, let me just say something, you know, this is interesting. You probably know this already, but I think your audience would be interested to know this. And of all major issues, abortion, gun rights, so on and so forth, immigration, the largest gap uh, is, is climate change. It is bigger by far than those other really divisive issues. Um, for whatever reason, you know, climate change has become extraordinarily partisan. Um, although conservatives do want to preserve the environment, it's very much looked at as a as a, a, a an attempt to 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 become a socialist country. That's in many ways. That's a lot of ideologues believe that the push of climate change is really just an attempt to try to, you know, equalize the playing fields, redistribute wealth. Um, it's not what I'm trying to do. I can I can tell you that, but uh, but that is but that is what is is felt, and so it's so there, it's a threatening uh, in many ways in the middle of the country, and so meteorologists have to deal with the politics of it too. Um, so you just have to decide uh, if if it's worth the risk for for each individual weather person across. But I feel like we're the best at communicating it. We those are the skills that we have. Right, and when it comes down to the science is there, there's proof of it, right? For people who may not believe that this yeah. is happening. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's something that people don't know. Um, if you ask people in, in, in surveys, you know, what percentage of scientists believe that climate change is happening and it's caused by humans, um, very rarely do people know that it's actually about 99% of climate scientists believe that climate change is, is not only happening, but also caused by humans, not just primarily, but almost all. In fact, really, it's all. I, I often say almost all because I want to cushion the blow to people who really don't believe in climate science. But the reality is, it's a hundred percent. A hundred percent of the warming we're seeing is is caused by by the burning of fossil fuels and the trapping of greenhouse gases. Um, but when you ask people, they don't realize there's that tremendous consensus. It's tens of thousands of peer-reviewed articles that that will back that up, and like seven that won't. <laughs> I mean, that's really the. Yeah. That's yeah. really the field. Yeah. And then just to simplify it for the sake of our viewers, the warming that's going on, ozone layer thinning out, correct? And that's causing us to warm. That's kind of the easiest way you explain it. Right. So, you know, the, 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 the I think the best way to, to, that people probably get it is just like a greenhouse. You go in a greenhouse, it's warm, right? So we, we emit these, we emit carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels. The carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere and the more carbon dioxide, the thicker your blanket. So when you put a comforter on during the winter, it traps all that heat in, right? But that's exactly what's happening in the atmosphere. The thicker that carbon dioxide blanket, the more heat is trapped back, uh, in, you know, inside inside the atmosphere, and the more it warms up. The ozone layer doesn't have too much of an impact necessarily. Um, it's it's the ozone layer is more just dealing with like shortwave radiation from the sun. Uh, which oftentimes can cause cancer if you have, you know, too much of that. Yeah. And that's why. We, but, so yeah, it's just the burning of fossil fuel. It really, is just as simple as that. It's it's actually a very simple science when you boil it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, like the solution may sound easy to say, but to go electric would be, in your eyes, kind of the best thing we could do. Yeah, I think it's um, really the one of the few only ways to do it. I mean, some people will push nuclear and nuclear is fine if you were okay with the risk. And a lot of people are, and I, I actually could go either way on it, but um, nuclear has become really expensive. Solar and wind is actually in many cases less expensive than fossil fuels. So in reality, we're just gonna move in the direction of what's the cheapest mm -hmm. and what creates the most jobs. And it just so happens that for every, so for every unit of energy produced, uh, you need about three times the amount of workers in solar and wind as you need for fossil fuels. So it creates about three times the amount of jobs. And a lot of people will say, well, if you need three times the amount of workers, how could it even be affordable for companies to stay afloat? Well, it turns out that solar and wind is so cheap 
that even if you hire three times the amount of workers, it's still cheaper in the long run for the consumer to purchase electricity through solar and wind than fossil fuels. Okay. And, and by the way, I, yeah. <laughs> another important, and the, way, and the way that I can relate that to viewers is that, let me show you, mm -hmm. that television about, that TV right there, which I use yeah. for television, I use for air, <laughs> uh, used to cost $5,000, now it costs $500. Right. So that's the difference between technology, which wind and solar is, and it'll keep getting cheaper, and oil and gas, which is a commodity like diamonds and gold. Once there's not too much oil and gas around anymore, the price goes up, whereas technology just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. So that's the economic reason. And that's why I often talk about economics when I talk about solutions, because I think it's really the way that we're going to solve this problem, if we can solve this problem. Yeah, if we don't get driven by the effects of what's happening then the dollar <laughs> will speak yeah. hopefully yeah. yeah exactly okay yeah. all right jeff i recovered a lot thank you so much is there anything else you wanted to make sure we say no, thank, thank you for having me on and thank you for talking about climate change